The National Geographic documentary, The History of the Machine Gun, featured a trained crew using a World War I Victus machine gun against a simulated battle line. 250 rounds for 250 targets. This modern automatic weapon designed to lay down a large amount of fire in a beaten zone with careful aimed bursts only managed 37 hits. Go back a few hundred years and the machine gun of the era was the bow. The mass deployment of archers in battles such as Cressy and Agincourt illustrated how a large number of archers could lay down a terrifying shower of arrows. However, as with a normal shower, that's the wet and harmless kind, most drops won't hit anything other than the ground. So given that the likelihood of actually hitting a specific target is very, very low, is it conceivable to assume that archers in the past would not have aimed or have instead tried to shoot as many arrows as possible? When people talk about uh, archers in the past, historical battles, ancient conflicts and so on, there's often a point where people will say that you can't miss an army because you're not shooting at a single precision target, you're shooting at an area target the size of an army. And since you can't miss the army, the goal was to shoot as quickly as possible, to get as many arrows out there as possible. Now, with that in mind, is it really fair to say that archers didn't need to aim? We know we can't assume that archers were all snipers with perfect accuracy, but is it fair to say that archers didn't need to aim at all? I'll be covering this in three different angles. The first one is what's involved in actually shooting a bow. The second point is looking at the tactics and logistics uh, in battle. Uh, and the third point we'll be talking about the culture and training of archers. Most of us who are familiar with archery today are thinking about the sport of archery, the kind where you shoot at a static target and you try and get as many points as possible. That has existed for as long as archery itself. Uh, it's been used as practice to hone the skill of the archer and especially in historical times to prepare them for battle. In battle, however, you are seldom aiming at a single target. You are more likely aiming at a mass of targets. It might be an advancing line of infantry or it could be to skirmish with an opposing formation of archers using bows and crossbows who are shooting back at you. Or it could be a line of cavalry riding knee to knee, dashing across the open ground and you have only a few seconds to let go of a few shots. So in many of these circumstances, the objective would logically be to shoot as many arrows as possible to get as many kills as possible. Because with that many targets, you are certain to hit something. Or will you? One thing we need to establish is the shape and density of these uh, army formations. Because we often think of formations as a kind of a video game uh, logic where we have these large rectangular formations where it's easy to hit every single person. Now we do know some formations were quite packed. We have things like the Roman legionary formations, the Greek phalanx, the Swiss pike formations, Viking shield walls, uh, the Scottish children are examples of very packed formations with the intent of uh, protection. Um, of the entire formation. And we also know that medieval knights were also very tightly packed when they were charging at the enemy. So they'll be riding knee to knee for maximum cohesion and maximum impact. Other times, however, the formation may have been arrayed in a single battle line with all the soldiers lined up ready to fight. And this formation may be only four or five ranks deep, sometimes more, sometimes less. And while this may be quite densely packed, it may have lacked depth. And when we think about the size and shape of these formations, perhaps the archer didn't really have that easy a target. We know that archers could aim at specific individual targets. And the most likely distance this 
probably would have happened would be somewhere between 30 and 50 meters depending on the weight of the bow the arrow used and so on and the reason why this is the kill zone is this is what we call the point on distance this is where as an archer to hit the target you place the arrow exactly where the target is in your line of sight you're not aiming below the target you're not aiming above the target so you're not shooting underhand in this case so with direct shooting this is the beaten zone and machine guns might call this the beaten zone because this is the guaranteed hit area assuming that the archer is capable of executing a clean shot all they have to do is point and loose that is point blank or point on we also know that the effective range of bows could be upwards of 100 to 150 meters. So again, depending on the bow used and the arrows used. And we also know that arrows could be shot even further than this, up to perhaps 400 meters. While this may not be effective in penetrating armor, they could still hit something. Now, this is what most people envision when they think of long range archery mass volumes of arrows shooting at the same time and having this um, area effect now if this was being used and this is what we're thinking archery is would an archer even need to aim if they are saturating an area with arrows well the odds of actually seeing let alone hitting one specific target is very very low we do have to appreciate the differences between shooting at short distance versus shooting at long distance. So with short distance, we can imagine this like target shooting. You have a flat plane where your arrows are too high, too low, or too far left or right. When you go from short distance to long distance, you move from a point target to an area target. It could be an area of the size of a whole backyard here. And surprisingly perhaps to some people, it's actually really hard to get an arrow to hit this particular area at over 100 meters away. Because while in target shooting, if you don't correctly gauge your elevation, your arrow might slip off the top of the, the bullseye or might clip the bottom of the target butt. But at extremely long distances, at over 100 meters, not gauging elevation correctly might mean your arrow will fly over the army by uh, 50 meters or drop short by 20 or 30 meters. So you're not guaranteed to even land your arrow in the size of this backyard. I mean, know that in history, apart from target archery, flight archery and clout archery were also very popular. Archers, as part of their culture, training and practice, did have ways to gauge distance and they would compete to see who can get their arrows closest to the area mark. So we know that a skilled archer would be able to gauge the distance to the target by visualizing how far it is. And we also know that a skilled archer would know how to elevate for the correct range to get an arrow to go that distance. And when the target might be a narrow line of infantry rather than a giant spread out blob, the ability to land an arrow within 10 meters of that line is more likely to guarantee a hit than you're shooting randomly over their heads. One more thing to consider is speed. Now again, many people will think that uh, in an area target, in a battle scenario, you would need to shoot as many arrows as possible into this packed formation. But something else to consider is assessing whether or not your arrows actually hit. Now we do this in target shooting. We lose an arrow and we watch the flight to see where it lands. We, we listen for the hit, we see the, um, the arrow strike the target and we can assess whether it's too high or too low. And these days we might use binoculars but even by the naked eye we will try to track the arrow. We're not trying to shoot as quickly as possible, we simply watch the arrow until it hits then we repair our next shot and adjust accordingly. And this is very similar to long distance shooting. If you're going to lob an arrow at a target 150 meters away, you probably are going to watch where it lands if possible. Try and trace the arc in the air if you can't see where it lands. So you'll lose the arrow, then you'll watch where it goes, and then you can roughly see whether it's too far or too short. 
because if you're going to go to the effort of losing an arrow and go to all the motions and do that, then you want the shot to count for something. You want to hit something in that army and not land in the forest the next kilometer down. And if the arrow lands well short of the enemy, then you need to adjust. And it makes complete and reasonable sense that each individual archer will try to the best of their ability to track their arrows and adjust. Otherwise, you're just dumping arrows to absolutely no effect. Assessing hits is vital for every range weapon. And today we have artillery, mortars, sniper rifles. These things will slow down the rate of fire because again, we want to ensure that there is a maximum possible effect on the target rather than just shooting at the target. Now these days, these calculations can be done by a computer or through mathematical formulas. Of course, in the battlefield, it's gonna be done by eyeball. So an archer, collectively or individually, would probably want to tighten their grouping as much as possible so they're getting more arrows in the area target. And the need to gauge distance, to assess the impact point and to make adjustments would not only likely slow down shooting, but indicate that there was some element of aiming involved in shooting regardless of distance. So knowing that there is a distinction between long distance shooting and short distance shooting, we can establish the likely tactics used in historical battles. We establish that there is a point of direct shooting where the target is close enough where you aim directly at the target and the arrow flies more or less straight at the target. And with the bows used at the time, this would have been perhaps 30 to 50 meters. This distance is analogous to the beaten zone of a machine gun, where any enemy that walked into this distance would be met by a wall of arrows. And this corroborates with descriptions of the Battle of Agincourt, for example, where the French were said to have lowered their heads to avoid being hit by arrows. Now, if we imagine the battle in this scenario, where the enemy is close enough where you don't have time to aim, well, in actuality, you didn't really have to aim because it's just point and shoot. Put the arrow on the mark and then let go. And if you don't hit the guy you're aiming at, you'll probably hit the guy behind him. At this distance, it's mostly instinctive shooting and it's close enough where a skilled archer who spent their career training at the butts is well prepared for this context. So you have the discipline, the consistency, and the continual shooting at close distance where they can hit without necessarily trying to aim. And as the enemy got closer, this will grow even more intense as the hit rate will reach nearly 100% for the entire formation. And we have to understand that there is a very large volume of shooting happening. If we have a fairly average estimate of how fast they were shooting, that may be around 10 shots per minute. And we understand that in the heat of battle, the adrenaline and the intensity will overcome the fatigue and pain then you are going to be shooting quite rapidly, but 10 is fairly modest. With a formation of, say, 5,000 archers, which might be the numbers at Cressy or Asian Core, if every archer was shooting at this rate, then in 60 seconds, you might have around 50,000 arrows flying through the air. And the advancing line might only be several thousand strong. So you've got far more arrows creating a war Okay, we call it an arrow storm or an arrow shower, but this is like a war of arrows that is continuously pelting the opposing line. This will actually physically push you back. So it's not as easy to run towards a line of archers, just as much as it isn't easy to run straight at a machine gun. So with a large number of archers who are shooting pretty much instinctively at short distance, you didn't have to shoot quickly when you have lots of archers. Now, this may be a bit more challenging if it's a cavalry attack where uh, a horseman could cover, let's say, 100 meters or 50 meters in a matter of seconds. And in this case, the archers might get one, maybe two shots off before they're overwhelmed by cavalry. But understand that this intensity and accuracy at short distance may be the exact counter to cavalry. 
So when the horsemen who are packed together are charging at archers, if the archers are able to shoot at 50 meters and they're coming really close, the arrows will bring down the horsemen or the horses. And all it takes is a few horses to fall down, to panic, and the entire formation loses its cohesion. It might not stop the attack completely, but it might render the attack mostly ineffective. And that is the deadly impact of massed archer fire. So in short distance, it's reasonable to assume that archers would shoot as quickly as possible, not excessively quickly, but as quick as they could with what they had, knowing that most of their shots were going to hit. It seems, however, that a lot of people look at this as happening at all distances, where even at 100 meters away or 200 meters away, you're just filling the air with thousands of arrows because you're obviously trying to hit an area target. But I think this is not a correct or an accurate assessment. When we look at long distance shooting, because it's harder to hit a target, it may be more likely that shooting would slow down and would be more purposeful. The role of the archer goes from being machine gun at short distance to artillery at long distance. And with artillery, you have to be more careful with how you calculate where your shots will land and you need to make each shot count. Because each shot is an opportunity. If you waste opportunity, you waste time and you waste ammunition. Now, this point about ammunition is quite important to focus on. Obviously, archers did not have unlimited ammunition. We were to average the number of arrows that a typical archer across history might have carried into battle, the number might be around say 40 to 50 on average. Uh, a typical quiver might carry around 30 to 40 arrows, uh, they might have two or three of these in arrow bags or in different quivers. So to be fairly conservative, let's say the average archer has 50 arrows available. As an average modern day archer, uh, perhaps shooting a light bow, I could easily discharge 20 arrows in just over a minute and a half. Now that's a fairly modest four to six seconds per arrow. Not speed shooting by any means, just shooting continuously until I ran out of arrows. That was 20 arrows in about one and a half minutes. Now, if I was shooting in a real battle, I was maintaining this rate of fire, I would have gone through my entire ammunition immediately available to me in around five minutes. And that's at long distance, where people seem to think that that's where you need to shoot quickly to get more hits. And that's assuming that they stay a long distance. If they don't advance quickly enough, then I'm basically going to run out of arrows by the time they reach the certain hit distances at close range when archers were most effective. And it's also easy to say how quickly it is to shoot when you consider only light modern draw weights. When we think about historical war bows, this may be upwards of 100 pounds. And you know, some people are more than capable of shooting 100 pounds, but shooting it quickly over a sustained period of time may be something that's pushing the limits of human ability. The amount of fatigue through lactic acid buildup is going to not only make them very tired but cause a lot of pain to the archers and of course in battle we can assume they push through the pain to shoot quickly and effectively but this will deteriorate over time as the battle goes on and the archers are continually shooting the effectiveness will slacken off the speed will slow down so it doesn't make sense to get your archers to exhaust themselves shooting rapidly on a long distance target. That opening engagement might just be enough to entice them to battle, to harass them, to disorganize them, but the real shooting will only begin at closer distances. And that's when you would really get your archers to take it up to 11 and shoot the best they can. This may be a reversal of what people might imagine. Again, people might think that at long distance, since you can't hit anything, just shoot as many arrows as possible. But in actuality, the tactics may have been that because you can't hit much at long distance, you took more time to shoot and shoot sparingly. Finally, we should also consider situations where you don't need to be quick 
all accurate. Now we've talked about short distance where you don't have to aim to hit. We're talking about long distance where you need to be a bit more careful and sparing in terms of how much you're shooting and where you're shooting. Then there's beyond effective range. I said before, effective range might be 100, 150 meters. If you're shooting at 300 meters or 400 meters, which is the max distance for many bows, now this situation might be, say, before or after battle, where the enemy is camped and your plan is to harass them, to demoralize them, to kill off any soldiers or animals in the open. So you have all the time for that evening or night to continually bombard that position with arrows. So you don't have to shoot quickly. You don't really have to shoot accurately. You're basically taking the time to just continually shoot over a prolonged period of time. Uh, this is basically shooting fish from a very, very big barrel from a very long way away. Now there's one more thing to cover, and I think this is one thing which uh, archers then and now would probably agree on. We take pride in marksmanship. Shooting heavy weights and shooting quickly is one skill, one challenge. But ultimately, the goal of archery is to hit the target. And we practice in order to hit targets more consistently and more precisely. The culture of archery, the training around it, the skills and drills, are aimed to hone our skills to be more accurate so we can demonstrate our skill through marksmanship. And it is seen through archery cultures around the world. In England, we have laws which mandate the ownership of bows, as well as the regular practice of archery on weekends. And this serves the purpose of elevating archery as the main valued skill. So people who were good in archery could be respected by the entire society. And then we have the Eastern lifestyles, where archery is a strong part of living, of religion, of spirituality, and it is the weapon of the warrior. A skillful, elite warrior would demonstrate their skill with the bow, and feats of accuracy with the bow were often regarded as just as epic as any other feat. So when you have soldiers and warriors who have years of training to become the best archers possible, does it make sense to deploy them in a manner which doesn't require them to aim? And if you didn't need archers to demonstrate their training through accuracy and consistency, then why train archers in the first place? If the purpose is simply to saturate the enemy formation with arrows, then just give every single soldier in your army a bow and a few arrows. Certainly, not every archer would have been an elite trained soldier. There were definitely cases of uh, perhaps peasants or just regular people with a basic background in hunting being conscripted into the army. But at the same time, we can't really just oversimplify archery as shoot lots of arrows at the general direction of the enemy because that really devalues the training involved in being able to use a weapon effectively. And every soldier was a specialist in their weapon. You can't just say, point this spear at the enemy and jab that way. Or looking at elite knights who've gone through a, a lifetime of training. Or samurai who live the way of the sword and the spear and the bow. And say, oh, all you have to do is ride that way. I really do think that something has to be said and valued with skill of arms. And if archery was so easy that you just had to give a lot of people bows and make them spam arrows, then why didn't most armies do that? While modern battlefields are different in terms of the style of warfare and equipment used, we then put soldiers through months and years of training and then say, look, here's an automatic rifle, just spray and pray. Uh, the purpose of training is to educate and equip soldiers with the skills and knowledge to assess what they need to do and when. There will be times where you will need to shoot quite quickly for suppression and there are times where you need to conserve ammunition and take aim shots. I believe that historical archers would have been trained to value these skills of marksmanship, accuracy and consistency. So an archer would be able to shoot accurately but also need to be adaptable. 
and they would take pride in demonstrating the ability to hit the target. Training a force to shoot accurately is going to be more versatile than shooting randomly and you don't need training to shoot randomly. In drawing conclusions, it's vital that we stress the nuances in history. We shouldn't be drawn to the extreme polar opposites and say, yes, they all aim at perfect accuracy, or no, they just shot as quickly as possible. The truth may be both and somewhere in between. We know that there are historical manuals and texts from English to Turkish to Arab to Chinese which go into detail about how to aim and there are methods for long distance and short distance. This would strongly imply that archers did have ways to aim in practical situations. Whether they hit or not, there are too many variables, but they definitely knew how to do so. And while you can't guarantee shots landing in the area or hitting their mark, aim shots would have greatly improved the chances of that happening. Every shot is a potential opportunity, and a miss is a missed opportunity, a wasted opportunity in time, in energy, and ammunition. And certainly, within reason, an archer or a commander will want to make sure that these shots counted for something. We cannot say that aiming wasn't important, and we can't assume that archers simply shot blindly. There was a time and place for every method and every technique, and I think it's perfectly reasonable to assume that archers in general would actually try to hit what they were trying to shoot at. And I think the most reasonable conclusion is that archers would aim as much as they needed to and shoot as quickly as they needed to. Anyway, what do you think? Post your thoughts in comments below. This is New Sensei. Hope you found this interesting and helpful. Thank you for watching, and hopefully, I'll see you next time.